A reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So, uh, a lot of you know that I'm not a big fan of clapping in worship. It's just a personal thing. Um, but one thing that we spent a lot of time doing at camp this summer were praise hands. So everybody give it a try. <laughs> it's like raising the roof, right? So just so you know, you've learned something new today. Uh, or two things, if you didn't know that I am not a clapper. <laughs> so feel free at any time to clap or show some praise hands today. I've known most of my life that my calling was to help people. When I was a child, I wanted to be a doctor, and then a lawyer, and then a teacher, and then a lawyer. In my teens, I worked in restaurants providing service for guests. Around the time I graduated high school, I thought I might like to become a minister one day but was incredibly insecure and had many reservations. I put it off, and eventually I became a bartender. <laughs> and we all know what they say about bartenders being therapists, priests, and the like. It was my job to hear people, to see them, to be present with them. I cannot adequately explain how well tending bar prepared me for ministry. <laughs> in seminary, the ministry of hospitality is a topic of conversation that comes up fairly often. My first semester at Union, I took a course titled Religions in the City, which would fulfill the requirements set out by my degree that I take at least two classes in what is called interreligious engagement. Interreligious engagement is exactly what it sounds like, by the way. It is a field that focuses on the interactions between and within religious traditions and communities. Have you been involved with the Poor People's Campaign? Did you see the episode of Queer Eye that had a Christian woman in gay Georgia talking to a gay man who had lost his faith? That is interreligious engagement in action. Anyway. This class was marketed to me as a basic world religion seminar that would emphasize that Christians aren't the only people who matter. I thought it would be a repeat of every other world religions or comparative religions class I'd ever taken. I thought it would look a lot like the Building Bridges program that I facilitated with our middle school youth. I don't say this often, but I was damn wrong. <laughs> Do you hear that? It's hell freezing over. That interreligious engagement class 
taught by the only Muslim woman on Union's faculty, changed me. Each week, I struggled with the readings, not because of the sheer volume of text she asked us to read or the convoluted nature of scholarly writing. No, I struggled because Dr. Lamptey asked us questions to keep in mind before, during, and after we read. Those questions, the writing and discussion prompts, forced me to analyze my own experience as a person of faith alongside the testimony and information provided by others. The final exam for that class was a four-part paper, less than 12 pages, and was the hardest thing I would do all semester. We had almost two weeks to complete the assignment, and each time I looked at it, Each time I read those questions or thought about how I would answer them, I sat there thinking, I don't know. I meant it. I didn't know how to answer the questions being asked. One such question was, what have you learned about yourself this semester by participating in interreligious engagement? It turns out, hospitality was the theme running through my early drafts. And so I focused my reflections on the ministry of hospitality and rituals of hospitality. After all that research, writing, and discussing, my conclusion is rather ordinary. How we welcome people to the table matters. There are subtle ways in which someone is told that they are not welcome things that those already within the community may not realize are unwelcoming. Geography and design matter. We visited a Hindu temple in Flushing, Queens. I don't know if you know anything about New York City, but that excursion was a two-hour trek, including a mile-long walk each way. We had a long conversation about how a person gets to their house of worship and what it means to a person who cannot drive to attend a congregation that is not otherwise accessible. Community norms matter. There are specific and often unspoken codes when it comes to dress for gatherings. A person who is not in the know sometimes sticks out. Many Christians recite the Lord's Prayer or other liturgical pieces in their worship services. On more than one occasion, I have quietly mumbled da-da-da-da-da, along with a reading that I didn't have access to the words of. How are we welcoming people to our space and our community? This question and the foundational idea that how we welcome someone to the table matters is a regular topic of discussion in most Christian congregations. It's accidental, almost, tangential, if you will, because it is a consideration that is engendered by the sacrament of the Eucharist. Congregations who offer communion regularly need to have these conversations. For example, Catholic churches do not allow persons who are not baptized into the Catholic faith to receive Holy Communion. I've been to a handful of Methodist or United Church of Christ congregations who are very careful to word their communion invitation to make it clear that anyone, baptized or not, was welcome at Christ's table. These communities believe that it is clear in Jesus' message that all people, saint, sinner, Jew, Gentile, pious, prostitute, powerful, poor, family, foreigner, are all welcome into the kingdom of heaven and thus to the Lord's Supper. This is a powerful message of welcome and openness that is conveyed through a few key words in the liturgy that tells a person like me, someone who was never baptized 
and doesn't believe in the divinity of Jesus, that I am welcome. The first time I was told I was going to hell, I was five years old. As a kindergartner on the playground, I didn't truly understand what it meant to me or to the other child who had said that when I admitted that I didn't know who Jesus was. Clearly a lot has changed for me since then. I'm a little older, a little taller, and I understand what it meant when that child told me I was going to hell. I also understand myself and Jesus a little better. I tell this story to contrast my experience at seminary. Although it hasn't had a specific denominational affiliation for some time, Union is technically a Christian seminary. Most of the people I go to school with are Christian, and all of the people I go to school with have a relationship with Jesus. None of them, in any serious way, would tell five-year-old me, or 27-year-old me, or anyone who was unaware of Jesus, that they would be spending an eternity in hell. Now, that is not to say that I, every person I interact with is a universalist. In fact, I know that several are not. The doctrine of hell is compelling for them. It is comforting to know that the wicked will be punished for their deeds. It feels like justice will be done and that good things will happen to good people. This is almost the opposite of my belief, but it is something that we can disagree about and still be in community. And while some students at Union are Unitarians in some way or other, many are not. The Trinity is a powerful force for them and reminds them of the ways in which the divine can appear in human form. Two years ago, I never would have identified myself as a Christian in any way. Over the course of my first year in seminary, I realized that the Judeo-Christian heritage of Unitarian Universalism is incredibly significant in my theology, worldview, and language. I use God language to describe the divine. Even though I don't necessarily believe in a capital G God, I believe that humans are social creatures and therefore need to live in community, which requires norms and commitments. Sometimes we call that a covenant. The first principle and the fourth source of Unitarian Universalism, the inherent worth and dignity of every person, and Jewish and Christian teachings of this part call us to respond to God's love by loving our neighbors as ourselves encompass my theology. But it made me wonder just how non-Christian I really am. My time at Union allowed me to explore this part of my theology and the questions I had about my beliefs. Many things went into this exploration. My classes and professors, my cohort and friends, and my experiences living in New York City. To be clear, a Master's of Divinity degree is one of the most challenging graduate degrees to complete. It is not just intellectual academic work. It is emotional, it is spiritual, and it is physical. It is work deeply rooted in community. No one can do it alone. In my New Testament class, I learned about the subversive nature of early Christianity, expressed first in the epistles and later in the gospels. I was offered a new way of seeing the followers of Jesus as freedom fighters and revolutionaries, people who were subverting the oppressive experience of empire. In my UU identity class, we read books on the ministerial fellowship committees, list of required readings, 
a list we barely made a dent in during the 12 week course. Many of them were interesting and frustrating, and a few had great impact on me. In that class, I learned that I am much more a universalist than a Unitarian, and I began to understand why I identify so strongly with the idea of universal salvation. My social ethics professor mentioned that Howard Thurman didn't call himself a Christian. He called himself a follower of Jesus. And that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. carried two books with him everywhere, a Bible and a copy of Thurman's Jesus and the Disinherited. I read Jesus and the Disinherited, and in doing so, I realized that I, too, am a follower of Jesus. The religion of Jesus is something I am totally on board with. The religion about Jesus doesn't really do much for me. Now, my faith in people who call themselves Christian was not always great. But at Union, I see the best of what Christianity has to offer. My best friend at school is a wife and mother whose husband holds the same degree that we are aspiring towards. They were both brought up in fundamentalist families and were members of a de denomination called Churches of Christ, which is the conservative version of Disciples of Christ. Neither of them hold the same beliefs that their denomination espouses, but they refuse to give up on their people. I spend almost every day interacting with their family. They are my family. We have deep theological discussions where we pose a question, such as, can God choose to do something that is evil? And work each other through our own answers to come to a belief that we can articulate. These conversations are invaluable. They push me to be a better thinker, pastor, and person. Now, living in New York City is fascinating. Every day, there is a new experience to navigate, be it subway delays, weird weather, or walking home from the grocery store looking and feeling like a pack mule. Living in Manhattan, I learned that the inherent worth and dignity of every person means something different to me when I encounter several people whose situation has forced them to ask for help on the street each day. That the people on the train who interrupt your book or music aren't just asking for food or money. They're asking for decency asking to be viewed with worth when they feel that they have no more dignity. They are incredibly courageous. I learned the difference a dollar makes in another person's life and the difference in my life when I truly see another person. I feel more connected to humanity. Seeing us in a new light all because I live in a city where I cannot escape it. It allows me to see the interconnectedness of humanity and hospitality and the ministry in our everyday lives. If the ministry of hospitality means that we consider how we invite people to the table, it also means that we all have ministerial presence. Unitarian Universalism affirms something often referred to as the priesthood of all believers. This is fitting. Each of us has the ability and authority to be in communion with the divine and one another. The irony that we also insist on one of the most rigorous credentialing processes for ministers is not lost on me. Voices that we listen to people we learn from, those who help us grow, should not come from a single ancestry, 
tradition, education level, or status. One of the ways that this is affirmed is through the six sources of Unitarian Universalism. The sources call on us to draw from many voices to form our beliefs. They give us a foundation to build on. The Unitarian Universalist Association asks ministerial candidates to read several books from many perspectives. Essex Conversations is a series of essays written by religious professionals who mostly work with children and families and are often called religious educators, although that title does not at all reflect what they do. In one essay, titled Doorway to the Sacred, Reverend McKenna Elizabeth Morris argues that the sources of our faith should be brought to the center. The sources provide a framework through which we explore, develop, and interact with our faith. They are the part of our living tradition that is alive. Morris believes that the sources are our doorway to the sacred. Through the sources and access to individual and shared spiritual journeys. Her work emphasizes the pan-generational need to experience the sacred and uses the sources to nurture our faith tradition. Morris's work with the six sources in congregational religious education has yielded beautiful fruit. She closes her essay with this. A religious education based on these sources can help folks understand differing options, perspectives, beliefs, and visions. A religious education based on these sources can help our people experience the sense of universal connection, their sense of spirit, in ways that will offer sustenance in times of suffering and celebration in times of joy. A religious education based on the call of each of these sources to committed and loving action will help change the world. Based on her writing, I suggest incorporating the six sources into everything that we do in our congregations. The seven principles are wonderful affirmations of what we believe. But peeking behind the curtain to understand where the principles came from and give us an opportunity to open the doorway to the sacred would provide a foundation that will hold us up when our faith feels like it's failing. My first, se my first year of seminary was hard. It was powerful. It taught me about myself and my faith. I stretched muscles that I didn't know I had, and I was given opportunities that I didn't know I could take. I used many sources to grow, including the communities I am lucky to claim as my own. There is nothing I would change about my experience, and I, may, I remain thankful for every moment and every person that has helped guide me along the path to my sacred home. Amen.